The following is a sewing bee that took place April 4th here at Shenandoah Sewing Vac. Well, not really here, by the internet. Nancy uh, did a great job of presenting her work and explaining why she did what she did. Uh, it watch and enjoy. Uh, we will have another bee coming up next month too. This time on the 2nd of May. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. So I'm unmuted. Can everybody hear? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. I am going to show you some of my quilts today. I have a little presentation that I'm going to show you. And I'm going to talk about a few quilts. Now, let's see here. I'm going to share um, this screen with you. And... So can now all I can see right now is my presentation. Can you see this first screen with my name and the yellow leaves? Okay. So yes. I am a fiber artist and I work out of uh, my home here in, um, in Breezewood. And I have been making art quilts for, I don't know, about six years. I started out as a traditional quilter making bed quilts and um i started uh, well i wasn't bored with them i just wanted to do something else so i started taking a one class in particular that was more artsy than it was quilty and it just opened up my eyes to a whole other part a whole other side of what we do as quilters. So we're making art, but we're using quilting techniques and tools to do it. This first quilt is 34 inches wide by 32 inches tall. And this one is, this one is called The Last Conversation. And this one is a little tough to talk about because my cousin Penny, Debbie's youngest sister um, had a really mean, nasty, horrible form of cancer. And she, she fought it and she, she hung in there for quite a while. And one day Debbie called and said Penny was back in the hospital again. And she said, if you wanted to go see her, go see her. So I, I did, and this is the quilt that I made in her honor, her memory, documenting what we talked about. This one is called, obviously, The Last Conversation, because that's what it was about, and this was, we talked about everything but her cancer, actually. We talked about high heels, you know, uh, designer purses and ball gowns. She was into ball gowns and she and I are both into purses and, and shoes. And, um, but the ball gowns, <clears throat> excuse me, the ball gowns were her thing. And we talked about that for a while and then she needed to rest. And what, then we talked a, a little bit after she rested and her tone was very different. It was very somber, and she was talking about she was talking about what she wanted after she passed. And so she wanted the family to have a picnic, and she said, "Take my ashes and throw them over the fence." And for some reason, pretty much everything we talked about in that conversation I had to document I wanted to document that and and this is it this this is the quilt and the next slide is just a little detail of that so uh, there are some tools that I use that um, other quilters well that traditional quilters don't I add inks and sometimes paints 
um, to these quilts. That background fabric is a floral, but was in a, in a very dark gray. And it was just appropriate. It's a commercial fabric and it was just spot on just what I, just what I needed. <sighs> this one is a very tough quilt to talk about and I promise the rest are not as hard. Uh, but uh, this is in memory of my 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 dear dear cousin Penny. So that's all I have to say about that. The next quilt was uh, something I did for Manassas National Battlefield Park uh, for a very uh, brief period of time. Well, not so brief, about 10 years. I lived in Centerville, Virginia, and I was I started quilting in 2007, actually um, started. Well, that's not that's not accurate. I started piecing. I didn't start quilting until about a year later, but uh, I started piecing. <clears throat> when I was down there and I lived so close to Manassas that I never went there. And it wasn't until I moved back to Pennsylvania that I decided to apply for some artist residencies at some of our national parks. Well, one of them is, um, oops, let me back up, sorry, uh, is Manassas National Battlefield Park. They have a an artist in residence program that lasts two weeks, you have to apply. And so I did, and lo and behold, I got in. I didn't think I would, really didn't think I would. But I went down there and the the very young, very sweet, very nice, um, uh, I don't know what, she was a ranger, I guess, is, still is. Anyway, she took me around the park just to get me orient, oriented. And she told me about the witness trees. And you know what? You know, sometimes you hear a word or a phrase that just resonates. Well, I had to find one. So when I was, you know, doing my thing, I went out to an area and found one of these witness trees because they have maps. And uh, so I took a lot of pictures and I sat at the tree for a while. And then I went back to the house I was staying in and I looked up on the U.S. Uh, the Library of Congress has an archive, uh, has archives of photographs from the Civil War. And I found photographs of regiments that served at that, in that field, it was amazing. At, in 1862, during the Battle of Second Manassas, uh, some New York regiment, anyway, they had photographs of this regiment. And I thought, holy cow, this is just incredible. So everything just started coming together. So this tree is actually fused. These are only pretty much just two different fabrics. So the background fabric is a commercial fabric by Moda. It's called watercolor. I added a little bit of blue it's it's a light gray and then the tree is uh, a very very dark gray almost black same watercolor you know only different color same make of fabric and i added inks and paints to enhance it so that that tree is many pieces cut up and fused onto the background the images i had to draw on with I used, first of all, I used regular number two pencil, and then I used inks to make it darker. Now these inks that I use are, and I'll show you later, um, are water-based inks, and you heat set them. Once you heat set them, they're permanent. So they were really pretty easy to apply. Drawing them was, uh, was a little tricky, um, but it wasn't bad because I was only drawing part of a face, not a whole face. So it went pretty well. This next one is called Ghost Soldier 1918. So after the, uh, the residency at uh, Manassas, I was really pretty much into this ghost, ghost soldier theme. And uh, there was a local call for entries up here in Bedford County, the local historical society put out a call for um, in Flanders Fields, 
the poppies blow between the crosses row and row. You know that poem. Anyway, our grandpa, I, I'm talking to, uh, because Debbie's on this call, she's, um, um, so our grandpa, Grandpa Furry served in World War I. So this call for entries resonated in more ways than one because our grandfather was there. He wasn't in Belgium, he was in France, but still, he served in World War I. The helmet he wore was very similar to this image of the Canadian soldier that's on here. And um, his uniform was very similar to this one. Anyway, so, um, so I looked up, read the poem, looked up images, because I've never been to Belgium. I've just, so I don't know what those fields look like, but I'm basing this on images that I found online. And poppies, to do poppies, it's really, really, really pretty easy uh, because when you do poppies, they're, the flowers are just all different shapes. You can't go wrong. <laughs> it's not like a rose. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop for a second here, and I want to make sure that... Ruh -ruh, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Can you still hear me? Is every... Can, am I? Okay, good. All right. So I'm going to start this back up again. Whoops. Let's go back here. All right. Um, so anyway, to get the background, I started with PFD fabric. PFD fabric is um, called prepared for dye. It is made by Moda. Actually, other manufacturers make it but it's it's made without uh there are no there's no sizing in it no nothing it's made to take inks dyes paints better than anything else actually so what i like to do sometimes is i'll paint my own ba background fabric by using um special acrylics that are made for fabrics and I water them down. I mean, really water them down. And I apply them like watercolors and just lay them out on the yard to dry. And it works really well if you want this uh, background that's just sort of hazy and watercolory. Anyway, it worked on this one. It worked for this. The soldier was done in inks and pencil. I had to draw him on too. Um, so, you know, it just worked. Uh, things just came together. Sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. This is another detail of just a little closer image of the uh, of this soldier. You can see my quilting is very, very dense, if you can see it at all. Um, um, but that one, that one's a lot of fun. Now this one I made for my cousin Larry, Debbie's brother. And this one has that hand-painted background as well. This is actually commercial fabric, but the background is hand painted. And um, then these, the flowers, the foliage, these are all individual pieces of fabrics. They're batiks or just regular commercial cottons that I cut up and put on and just fuse down on here. The bird is actually drawn and stitched. And then there's a little bit of ink and paint added to that. But the foliage that you see, to get that highlight and shadow and that three-dimensional look about it, that's all done with inks. So each flower is one, one piece of fabric. And then I just filled in with inks. It's really not hard to do. It takes a little practice, but it's really not hard. This was a fun one. Um, Larry's wife, Fran, loves hummingbirds. And he wanted to surprise her for her birthday with you know uh an artwork and so he asked if i could do something and what do you say to your cousin you said of course i'll do it <laughs> so this one right here i did just last year i i think i, I mentioned that i'm into you know applying for residencies at national parks last year I got into, I was so fortunate, got into Great Smoky Mountains National Park as their artist in residence in September. So I spent the whole month of September 
exploring the park and uh, taking pictures. And when I got down there, I thought that I would be wowed and inspired by the the mountain vistas and the you know the distance and the views and the gorgeous you know views from on top of those mountains. What instead inspired me was the water that ran through it. And it was just so clear and so beautiful. In places it was, you know, white water and rushing over rocks. And in other places you had still pools that were crystal clear. And so I have a lot of pictures of the water at uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It was just incredible. This is the second one uh, that I did. And uh, what in, so the name is Water Dance and each, the name of the series is Water Dance. So I've done more than one of these. And uh, the name was actually inspired by these two little kids they were maybe eight, 10, maybe. They looked like brother and sister. Their parents were sitting on a bench along the side of the river, but, and this was a, if you know Great Smoky Mountains National Park, there's the Okana Lufty area, and I don't know if that's the name of the river or not, but by the Okana Lufty Visitor Center, the river runs right next to it. And I was walking along, along the river and there were these two kids in the water and they were practicing ballroom dancing you know what i mean that kind where you're you know holding their partner's hand and one is behind the back they were doing that these two little kids and it was just it just blew my mind so anyway i took pictures of them and i took pictures of lots and lots and lots of water and this one is one of the uh uh, one of the photographs, uh, based on one of the photographs, this is actually a quilt. This next one is also from um, the water uh, images that I took. This one I call Beside Still Waters. And this one I thought was just, um, well, just the image that I took that this is based from was just one of those haunting images where the water was so still, it was so quiet. And, and you know, you had the dark pool in the background, you had the shadow, you know, the woods was very shadowy. The light was coming from behind my back, you know, projected forward into, but stopped at the edge of those woods. So this was um, another one of those magical, magical moments I, really ha I had to do something when I had to when I saw this picture and uh, so yeah anyway the the fabrics are here are all commercial fabrics by the way and I have discovered recently that um, Stonehenge fabrics by Northcott work really well when you're trying to convey water they work really really well this is my most recent water dance. This one is called Okana Lufty because this is the area where I saw those, those kids. And um, so I can't zoom in on this, but the quilt is hanging over here, so I'll show you later. But this is, uh, this is all commercial fabrics, thread, different colors of thread, many different thread changes in this one. And the thread, can help your composition or it can just be fade into the background or it can play a play a role in your com composition and so this one when i was working on the water i was really really frustrated because my fabric was too dark but there is a way to compensate by using white thread when you need it to show reflection or uh depth um, so the black thread that's used on the right darkens this fabric. The white thread makes it lighter. Ha ha, who knew? Anyway, it was, uh, it was a challenge and, um, I had a lot of fun with this. I pretty much questioned every move I made. Uh, but you know, it all worked out in the end. 
okay here is a detail showing you the how the how dense the stitching is i quote really 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 densely um just because started out doing that way and it just it just seems to work because that's how you make your your quilting part of your composition this is another one uh we we did a little bit of traveling last year and we visited lake tahoe for a little while and the water there is also clear but the water color is very different than uh lakes and ponds and streams that we have out here out here on our side of the country it, it's very green but out there it was aqua blue it was just amazing uh this one is very small quilt and uh anyway it's that the background fabric is actually one ombre dyed piece of fabric it's not stonehenge it's something else but it's cut up because I took the darker parts and I needed to use that as shadow. And then I added inks over here on the left hand side where you see the rock uh, standing up out of the water. That's a, that's actually a Stonehenge fabric and the rocks in the center and the rock to the right. That's also Stonehenge fabric. It was, uh, that was a lot of fun to do. A lot of fun. Okay. So, Sometimes when I'm tired of doing uh, the, uh, the, you know, landscapes, I really, really, really love doing whole cloth quilts. So this is one piece of fabric and one color of thread. So we have, if you're familiar with the color wheel, uh, blue and yellow work well together. They are not opposite. They're not complementary colors, not quite. Blue and orange are complementary on the color wheel, but if you have a, a royal blue like this was, is, and a yellow, you use a yellow, a high value color thread, then you have, it gives you high contrast and it gives you visual interest and texture. And so that's what I did with this one, this feathery fantasy that I did for a friend who was very, very kind and very, very generous. And uh, she, uh, so I made this for her and I still love it. And I, and I, although she has it and it's hanging in her sewing room, I think I might make another one to hang in my own. I really, really like that one. So this shows you a little bit about how I go about making a whole cloth. This is different from the previous one. This one's uh, about the same size, maybe a little smaller. But you can see my registration, I guess you call it registration marks, my markings. Um, in the background, I use a white chalk pencil to make my marks. And, um, and the quilting actually is done in the background of this. There's, it's densely quilted with a color that's very, very similar to that background. So that's how you make something that you want to show off. That's how you bring that, that's how you make the background, you know, go into the background. And that's how you bring the other quilting with the yellow thread come forward. It's a lot of fun. It really is. This one was, is done with gold, silk, silk habitat i think it's called it's that real shiny silk and um silk thread and we learn as we go along i used silk batting silk batting is my go-to batting because it's lightweight it quilts unbelievably beautifully and it doesn't get stiff because you'll see in this picture how dense my quilting is you see how that background behind the feathers there recedes because it's so densely quilted and so that's how you see the feathers uh this definition in the feathers but um where was i going with that my big mistake my big lessons learned here is if you want to make a whole cloth quilt you want to use a batting that 
will um, poof up a little bit. So for whole cloth quilts, I now that I learned this lesson, which I use silk batting, silk batting relaxes and becomes very fluid and pliable and drapey. Wool batting is going to poof back up. So if I had used wool batting, the background would be just as it is, but those feathers would be more pronounced. Lessons learned. That's all right. And so um, this one, this is my first water quilt that I made in 2017. I was trying very, very, very hard to do water for a couple of years and I was not succeeding and it just wasn't going very well. So one day I was up here and failing miserably at a water quilt and said, okay, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to go to the kitchen. I'm going to pour myself a nice refreshing adult beverage and, and then come back upstairs and clear my sewing room of everything and do something else. Well, instead of pouring that adult beverage, I poured a glass of ice water and the glass started to frost up. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, <laughs> maybe I was thinking too big. Maybe I have to start small. And so I came back upstairs and made this. So that frost on that glass is from inks. And I'll show you the inks that I use in a minute, but that's made with inks. Uh, the lemon, the knife, and the ice and the lemon in the glass are fused. The rest is just background and inks applied to that fabric. So, um, so I'm going to go back and join you. Stop sharing. And I'm going to try to get back. Okay, I think I'm back now. That My free motion is still just outside the ditch. <laughs> well, you know, just so you know, I teach free motion quilting. Oh. And um, uh, on the domestic machine, everything I do is on a, uh, I have a, I, I just use a Bernina. I have Berninas and uh, that's just because. And I know your sewing studio is beautiful. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Did you, yeah. Did, did you say 2007? Yes. That's when I started learning how to piece. A friend of mine, it was, yeah, well, I had some pretty tough times in 2006 and, uh, and I wasn't handling it very well. And my dear, dear friend, Sue Ann said, Nancy, we're going to take a quilting class. <laughs> and, and I said, what? I didn't know how to sew. And uh, thanks to Debbie, by the way, Debbie Tangren, who had the class at Shenandoah Sewing Back, um, I now learned how to sew. I can quilt, but sewing is a different skill set. And yes. she has got that. She knows how to do that. I mean, she designs costumes. This is, you know, I am in awe of my cousin, Debbie. And Nancy um, is so sweet. <laughs> I cannot quilt. I took two or three of her classes, and it took an hour lesson in how how to use the rotary cutter. <laughs> That's how much I learned. So, <laughs> and when I taught the last class, my students loved the rotary cutter and took to it in less than five minutes. <laughs> so Nancy is awesome. <laughs> Debbie kept saying, pin it, pin it. Well, I don't like to pin. I don't like pins. Nancy, pin it, pin this together. <laughs> Okay, Debbie, I'll pin it. And then I've taken them out and, <laughs> and uh, use scissors. I don't use scissors. I use a rotary cutter. <laughs> That's the difference between quilters and sewists. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm amazed that you go to this, the, the free motion quilting side. Well, that's not even free motion quilting. That's just, you're above and beyond all that. I still just like the piecing. 
you know. So I've got 16 or 17 tops. Um, this is the closest I come to finishing a quilt is getting the batting and the backing on. <laughs> you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And if you like to quilt by check, there's nothing wrong with that. Send it off to someone. But you want to know something we're most passionate about, things that we're good at is things that we are most passionate about. And you are very passionate about piecing right now. And that's very obvious. So your, your piecing skills are just Oh yeah, when you get that, when, when you get that, those uh, perfect pinwheels, <laughs> there's, they're very pretty. There's nothing better than a perfect point. <laughs> you do a very, very, very good job. They're just beautiful. <laughs> they, they weren't supposed to be backwards. <laughs> If I ever followed a pattern like to the letter, I might actually accomplish something. <laughs> the minute you you go off topic with a pattern, mm -hmm. you can start with a pattern, but you can say, "What if I uh, did this?" And exactly. if as soon as you do that, you are you're exercising that creative muscle. You are being creative go with that. Sometimes things work beautifully. Sometimes they don't quite, but they're always the lessons learned. And some quilts are never, ever supposed to be finished. They are just so don't freak out about your UFOs. Seriously, don't freak out. Some are never going to get finished and that's okay. They're, they were practice. <laughs> this quarantine has made it possible for me to finish several of my UFOs, but I prefer to call it now the PhD projects half done. <laughs> and I have a plethora of projects. <laughs> this quarantine or lockdown could last several more months and I would still have plenty to do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. But I am in awe of quilters because it's just a skill that I understand, but I just don't have the technical wherewithal yet to do that. Yeah, and, and it's and it's I, I don't have I love to learn new things, but I don't like learning. If that makes absolutely no sense. I just want to know it. You know it? I don't want to practice it. I just want to know it. So to sit there and and um, I keep trying to like uh, this week's, um, but I'm trying to teach myself angles without having to buy some $400 uh, ruler. Um, so I'm trying to teach the V block and and different different V block. And holy crap! I'm, I'm oh, geometry's not math. <laughs> Sewing is great, uh, but when you make a mistake, it's it's always be one with the seam ripper. <laughs> but, but, That's right. But, with costumes, though, it's easy. I take, I can look at what it should be, and I can make it. And if it turns out, yeah, it's close. It's a costume. It's not runway fashion. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my my mine is uh, trying to remember to put the little quarter inch doohickey up at the top, and then um, and then the 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 back. There's no way to quilt that. You'd break twelve needles. <laughs> Actually, um, your needle makes all the difference in the world when you're quilting something with very a lot of. Uh, Seems like that that come together. I did pretty good on this one. So you can do it. Absolutely, you can. Absolutely. How long does it take you to do one of these quilts? With I mean, they're so densely densed. Well, um, when I if I'm doing a forty by fifty inch 
quilt like the ones you see behind me um those will take about a week uh but when i start doing that i don't do anything else and um my husband can tell you you know i don't cook i don't you know i have to really have to take a mental break to go downstairs and fix dinner um but uh yeah yeah i have a tendency to just do nothing but that I'm totally focused because there's so many thread changes and um the quilting itself is actually pretty easy it's just that figuring mm -hmm. out how you want to do foliage how you want to do water there's a certain way to do well a certain way that i do still water and i make this motion because you know i'm using a domestic machine i'm not i don't have a long arm i don't i don't i don't think i'll ever have a long arm um too much of a learning curve but yeah. uh you know i got this and i can do that judy didn't you say your sister is buying a long arm or she has a long arm Yes, yeah, she took a class at the Scrappy Apple in Winchester, and she just fell in love with it. And I'm not sure how big it is, because uh, I haven't seen her since this uh, virus has been around. And she works at the hospital, too, part-time. So uh, I haven't conversed with her to see if she's got it in yet. But she she decided, she every quilt she makes, she sends off on it to, to have it. So she decided to get her own. Yeah, a certain amount you want to, but I mean, did she you now she went through the whole long arm with like I just want to, I just want to, I just want a sewing machine with a bigger throat, <laughs> right? I don't know. It's just a do that. Yeah, Apple had offered a class on it, and she takes a lot of them because she lives in Winchester. Right. And she, she, she said, I she said, I lost it that day. I fell in love with it and I ordered it. There you so go. She's, wow. she's practicing for retiring, which I think at the end of the year she will. Uh, and she puts together some really pretty, just like the one you have there. I'm, I'm sitting there looking at all the angles thinking, that's beyond a square. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. I love all the angles you have in there, the designs. That's fine. I, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah. 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 Um, Moda's doing a, I don't know if Ralph's in on it, but Moda's doing a grunge, a grunge fabric quilt contest. I don't know if they put it on hold, but if you use just Moda grunge fabric and you have to design a quilt, very regular size little laptop quilt, um, but it has to be original. And so I'm sitting there searching. There's nothing original in quilting. I mean, every, every, quilt, every quilt's original because you change it. It's like a recipe. Don't follow it. Yes, <laughs> it's exactly. A it's Our, a guideline. Yeah. So everyone is original. And that's, that's just how I look at it. I mean, because this is, I haven't been able to see this block with the, the kite quilt, the kite, the kite block and the V block. And then, of course, the pinwheel. I guess it's all in just how you arrange it. I love to cook. I have a cheeseburger soup recipe that I oh. have never made the same way twice. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I have a magnet, magnet on my refrigerator. It says, I don't cook, I create. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> how, many, how many spools of thread are in some of those, those quilts? I mean, I use a lot. And my favorite, my favorite is Aurifil. Yeah. Um, Definitely. And uh, but when I'm quilting the, you know, and I'm doing a a whole cloth, especially with silk, I love to use silk thread, and it's hundred weight. It's very very thin, so you have to use a special needle. And I was really really lucky when I took Debbie's class at Shenandoah Sew and Back. I couldn't believe it that Ralph had so much silk thread. Silk thread is just amazing. Um, and I, I bought up, I think, his whole stash, or most of it anyway, because it's hard to find. Yeah. Quilt shops don't stock that as a rule. It, it's really hard to find. You have to order it online. And, you know, when you want something, a thread, especially thread, I want to go to it right now. And I was so lucky that they have it at Shenandoah. So if you ever decide to use 100 weight thread, <laughs> use use silk the silk thread that ralph has there it's 
it's wonderful thread. It's good stuff. You have to use a, a needle, that, a really thin needle, a uh, quilting needle, but I think, what's the smallest size? 7511 or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, but you use the thinnest needle and it works beautifully. So, so if you if you ever decide to use silk and it's it's really not all that hard, you have to stabilize it. And I like to use a Pellon product. It's a woven, cotton woven, fusible interfacing. It's called Pellon 101. And um, anyway, that's really good stabilizer. And you put that on the back, you fuse it to the back, it stays there, but it makes silk behave yeah. itself. Like a quilting cotton, it turns silk into, it, it behaves itself and it's not gonna unravel and it's not gonna move around on you. And you can quilt it, you can layer it. The Pellon 101. Okay, Ralph, so we don't have our PhDs and things of that nature. At what point do you try to fix a boo-boo or just go on to the next one? I'm sorry, say that again. Okay. We all have our unfinished quilts, but you decide that uh, it's not say it's not worth saving. I mean, do you have a whole box of oops? <laughs> I'm getting a lot of feedback, and I I didn't I, I didn't hear the question, and I'm so sorry. Um, you got a lot of oopsies. Yes, <laughs> a lot. That's how you learn. Absolutely, doodly, yes, a lot of oopsies. I have a closet full of quilts that are oopsies. That at one time I thought, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, this is great. This is genius. No, it's not. And, and that's why they're in the closet. I don't know what to do with them. If I had a dog, they'd be on the dog bed. But um, yeah, maybe they go on the floor for the cats. I don't know. But yes, yes, it, indeed. I've got years of quilts that are oopsies. I've got some that were so bad and so awful that I've thrown out. Oh, it can't get that bad. Yeah, seriously. It can't get that bad, Nancy. Oh, yes, it can. No. <laughs> no. Oh, my. <laughs> Cut it into strips and do a strip quilt. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, Nancy, you use the same machine for all of your, these art or painting quilts. You use the same machine. Yep. That's, sure that's phenomenal. It's a, uh, I have a Bernina and uh, the only reason I have a Bernina and not a brother is because the Bernina dealer, when I was buying my first machine, the Bernina dealer was closest to me. And Debbie is, Debbie swears by brother. And if I had, and when I was looking, there was a brother dealer, but they were too far away. And yeah. I, at the time I was in Centerville, they were in Woodbridge and that was too far you know, if I had an emergency, I'd have to go to Woodbridge. And in rush hour traffic from Centerville, it's crazy. It's yeah. two hours away. So, years, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I opted for the brother. But I'm sure, I'm sure, if you're looking for, you know, a bigger harp space, throat space, whatever you want to call it, I know brother has, I'm well, no, I don't know for sure. But we're going to, Debbie and Ralph will know for sure. So what I'm quilting, yeah, uh, the feed dogs are down and I'm quilting. But, you know, this is a domestic machine with all the bells and whistles that all the other ones have. Uh, but, yeah, uh, when, I'm, when I'm quilting, the feed dogs are down and it's just, it's me. It, it's, I am become, as Debbie likes to say, one with the, not only the steam ripper, but one with the machine. And, you know, and you're just, yeah, you don't need anything fancy if you're going to do that. But I, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. That's, you, have a, you have a stitch regulator, a stitch regulator? I do, I do, but I haven't used it for years. And there's a reason for that. So, um, so there are a lot of machines that have stitch regulators now. And um, when I first started free motion quilting, I used it because they sold me on it. They said, this will make your make your quilting look really good. And they were right. It does. It does make you look really, really good right out of the box. And then as you develop your skills 
as you get used to that, it becomes a crutch. And you become so used to using it that if something goes wrong with it, then you're, you're stuck. So that happened to me. I was using that thing for about four years and something happened to it. It just stopped working. You know, it's supposed to take off when you start moving. And it didn't. It slowed down. It stopped. It wouldn't move. And I had so many problems with it. And I thought it was me. I thought it was me. And so I kept calling the shop saying, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Help me. And I wasn't getting the answer that I wanted, um, which was, it's not you. It's this. And it was one shop that I called. And they said, oh, yeah, the stitch regulator needs to be recalibrated. And there's a little spring in there that needs to be replaced. Really? Why didn't they tell me that? So I took that thing off and I never looked back. I put on a, a uh, I bought a presser foot that's just for free motion quilting. And I never looked back. But after that time spent, you know, doing this with the regulator, once you take that off and you, it's you your hands, the fabric, and the, you using your presser foot to control that speed yourself, you can do so much more. The stitch regulators that you put on the machine don't give you enough visibility behind them. So you can run over your stitches. When you're using a standard free motion felt foot, presser foot, there's, there's less bulk behind it. So you can, you have much better visibility. So whenever I have one. Yeah, that looks like it. So yeah, a stitch regulator has a lot going on behind it. There's because it's got its own little computer something um, behind it and it's awkward, it's big. You can go from left to right very easily. But if you're moving vertically, you can't see. If you're going in a if you're going in a certain direction, you can't see what you're doing. So so yeah, it's good in certain ways. It's good to get the practice and then you take it off and you go on your own. And my Bernina friends don't, and my and the Bernina dealers don't like me saying that because they like to sell the Bernina on the stitch regulator. And and yeah, it's good. It's a good sales but pitch. You don't need it. So you on the background behind you, um, you've got, you've got, um, a cow? <laughs> what is it? A what? There's like a cow behind me. I oh, you know, I have to apologize. I don't speak southern, and you guys have accents. <laughs> I need, I need closed captioning underneath you guys. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna mute my phone and I mean my um, I'm gonna mute my computer and then I'm gonna get on my phone and I'm gonna go show you that's an alpaca and that's something I've been struggling with for a few months now that's a UFO and my husband keeps telling me to finish it finish it finish it and I'm stuck because it's the first animal portrait I've ever done so I'm gonna mute this and I'm gonna go on the other one so I'll be okay can you hear me? Oh, now it looks yeah. like Alpaca. Okay, so <clears throat> this oh. is a photograph. Oh, <clears throat> isn't she cute? Isn't <laughs> she cute? She was so funny, and she had such a personality. Um, we were visiting some friends, and they have alpacas, and she has all kinds of alpaca fiber. She she wanted to. So this is actually cotton um, fabrics that I. I hand painted and um, hand painted all these fabrics actually. And, uh, you know, I'm working on it. It's, she's a work in progress. She's a work in progress. Right. This is one of the Tahoe quilts that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually the second one. This one is called Autumn Trail. That's crazy. And um, wow. so. I'm going to zoom in and let me turn a light on. Maybe you can see 
the quilting is very, very dense. Oh my. I don't know if you can see the quilting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty dense. But yeah, this one is based on a photograph that I took in when walking in the woods. Wow. Um, this one is actually just a panel that I found at a quilt shop. And what I wanted to do with this, I, I just wanted to quilt, quilt it. So I don't know if you can see the quilting. Mm -hmm. It's very, um, yeah, there you can yeah. see it. If I zoom in on some of the shadows. Anyway, this is Gustav Klimt's Woman in Gold. And I just love the painting. And when I saw it in fabric, I thought, oh, I have to have it. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is the one you just saw in the pictures. So this is That's crazy. the... Um, yeah, now let me see. Let me get a little closer. If you can see... Uh, okay, there we go. So this is all just fabric, thread changes, inks. That's all there is to it. And wow. this is, yeah, this is all Stonehenge fabric and inks. And I don't know if you can see the, you can see the quilting on this one differently, better. This one was, let me move back a little bit. This was the first one. This was the first one I did. I'm not, I'm not as crazy about this one as I was as I am the other ones. So let me see. Okay, so there you go. Wow. So now you can see some of the quilting. It's very, wow. very dense. So um, I don't know how. There, there. Now I can see what you're seeing a little better. You see how dense that is. And these are just this, this is just ink. That's a little bit of white ink on there. Then go and on. then this one, this is the one that took the most time to quilt. So this one is also 40 by 50. And you saw this one. This is a gold-ish yellow thread. So this is one piece of fabric. That's actually one piece of fabric. And this is fused on top of it. But you see what the thread color does with the fabric. Oh, yeah. So this is black thread quilted very densely. And look at that. Just between the two. Look at the difference that makes. You can see some of the fabric in the background. I mean, behind the thread. But it's amazing what the thread does to it. And the tree itself is done with just thread. A little bit of ink. These are two pieces of fabric, just fused. I like misty fuse. And I don't know why my camera keeps getting fuzzy and, and not fuzzy. But anyway, this isn't all that hard. It took a while to learn how to do this. It takes practice. And this is the, this is the one I showed you in the, in the picture. So this is fused. This is just ink fused inks quilted very densely this is quilted black on black i do not recommend that i thought i was going to go blind i don't know why i thought i could actually quilt black on black it was yeah it was a <laughs> it was not fun it was a bit of a nightmare but anyway looks good. and this and so this is actually these are my cottons wow so I have a little bit of fabric. I had a friend come in and say, Nancy, I think you need more fabric. I don't think you have enough. So <laughs> She has that already washed and ironed and ready to go. I'll have you know. She is so organized. <laughs> These are flannels for the most part. These are flannels and my tools and all sorts of stuff. Now I'm going to mute this one and go back onto my computer. All right. So... That's a pretty quilt. That's a really pretty quilt. Oh no, that's my ugly quilt. I I, I oh, still, okay. I was practicing binding and okay. I I shortchanged myself and never got back to it. Now that I have the skill and know where I went wrong, I can I can fix it now. But honestly, 
I just throw it over my sewing machine so that I don't get dust on it. My 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 favorite thing. I'm a I'm I like count it cross stitch. So most of my quilts lately have had a little a little little cross stitch in them. That's what I like to. Like uh, I I I done a baby quilt and um, how did I switch this? Oh, there it goes. Um. I did. I, I love these baby quilts, and the, the reason this one isn't done yet is because I'm I'm getting ready to do a, a cross with label, you know, with all the pertinent information and my label information and her baby information, and I'll throw that. I'll put that into some pieced backing for the back of that. So, yeah, I could do. I. I've got lots of crap. <laughs> very nice. Very, very nice. That's really pretty. So I guess Ralph's on the phone, isn't he? Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, it keeps the hands busy. That's all that matters. That and uh, uh, T-shirt quilts for friends, you know. I, I do piece quilting because your, your free motion gives you joy. My piecing gives me joy. But my friends want, you know how friends are. Oh, you have a sewing machine? Make this. I'm like, you make it. <laughs> I find that just a little bit, um, I because someone said that to me years ago. Um, she said, you have a sewing machine, don't you? Yeah, I do. I have two. <laughs> Here, fix these pants. <laughs> So I took those pants home and I kept them for six months until she asked for them back because I don't know how to do that. That is not the kind of sewing I, that is a completely different skill. She just didn't want to go. She just didn't want to pay someone at the dry cleaners to fix it for. So I held on to it till she wanted it back. And I said, all right, sorry, never got time to do this. <laughs> she never asked me to do anything else ever again I, oh, my sister did the same thing my sister asked me oh she said oh yeah you can sew here's a pair of shorts can you fix these for me there's holes here and here and here i said sure missy i'll fix them for you so i took them home and i don't know that kind of right no because uh, i don't have that that knowledge base what i do know how to do is fuse fabric so I, <laughs> so I took fusibles and, you know, fabrics that I have, commercial, you know, fabrics, and I fused them over those, those holes, you know, one from the back, one from the front. And then I tried to, to do a, uh, what do you call it, blanket stitch around the, the patch. And I was successful in some areas and not so successful in others. Some of those holes were still there. But she never said a word, and she never asked me to fix anything else again. So, <laughs> there you go. now you have to be real tight in my circle. Uh, I, 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 um, I have a. I did one a long time ago. I did a, a baby quilt for her that I had on her. She was, in, in, and now she's working on her kid. First of 27, she says. I said, well, you know, whatever. So you're only getting one baby quilt. You get one baby shower, one baby quilt. And uh, and then my sister, and then the t-shirt quilt, just to get the bunch of them, they're all whole concert. Um, so yeah, you be real tight. But uh, another, uh, a, a daughter once removed. I don't know how that was, but you know, we all have those people. Um, she asked me for a quilt, and I told her, I said, well, you go buy the fabric, and I'll teach you how to quilt. And that usually shuts anybody up. Yeah. Dude, real quick. I got to do it? Yeah. I'll show you. Well, it shut her up. Well, we're under quarantine. She went out and bought a sewing machine. So that was funny. Because she finally took it out of the box. She got it at Christmas time. She finally took it out of the box so she could make masks. I, I'm not going down that road, but I, I, 
No. Um, but she, she's, I'm teaching her. I'm like, okay, we'll do this. And she's like, okay, where do I put the thread? <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. You, how long have you had this machine? Like, I just took it out of the box. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> Let me give you Ralph's number. <laughs> But yeah, that's you. That usually, yeah, you gotta do what gives you joy. And I just, I can't. That alpaca, that alpaca in the background, just tripping me out. Those eyeballs. <laughs> that's done with one piece of fabric and a whole lot of ink. So, you just fill in. These are the inks that I use. These are called. These are Sukuniko inks, and they come in these tiny little bottles. And you use a an applicator to apply them, and you can see that I use this. I use black and white all the time. And this is a tiny little sponge on the end here, and you just dip it in the in the ink, and then you you don't use it like a pencil. You just sort of shade it. You know, add the highlights, and with the black you add the shadow. That's all there is to it, and you just. Inks are for um, detail and highlight shadow really works well. Uh, I don't know what I would do if I hadn't learned how to use these inks. It's just tools in your toolbox. You know, you right. all know how to use Debbie knows how to use different presser feet and she knows she knows embroidery embroidery. That's another, if you do embroidery, oh. that's another skill set that is just beyond my comprehension because you got to know how your machine thinks you got to know how to what buttons to press and what your design is supposed to look like and it's enormously complicated yeah, just, no. somebody once told me quit giving up and just go forward no matter how bad or how ugly it is just just finish it just yes finish it so that's Done why is better than perfect yeah that's, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the best, I don't know. I don't know what to, I don't know what to say other than if you find that you're stuck and you put a quilt down, sometimes you need some time to think about it mm -hmm. and then pick it back up again when you're refreshed, rejuvenated. It could be that you were, you're doing the same pattern or the same kind of sequencing over and over and over again and you're tired of it and you just need to do something else for a while i want to ask debbie yes when you're doing garment construction do you have the same do you have the same thing when you if you're working on costumes do you have to put something just put one aside for a while because you're either frustrated or you're tired of it or you're bored with it or something and move on to something else and then go back to it? Yes. I have to think about it sometimes because I'll, I'll think of one way to do things and the director will come back and say, oh, yeah, but I want, you know, three layers of tulle underneath the skirt, you know, and I'm going, Oh, well, the skirt that we have that I'm altering is velvet and it's heavy. You want three rows of tool underneath that? Um, or I'll have a really nice idea for a costume and the director will say, Oh, our main actor is a size 10, but the the understudy is a size 22. <laughs> so you have to figure out how to, you know, when the budget is, is zero, you know, for costumes, you have to figure out how to make do for a similar costume for the main character and the understudy that you're not using so much extra fabric. That's funny. <laughs> now for, um, we had the Wizard of Oz and Glinda was a size 10 and a size 22. So I made one skirt and instead of elastic, I used a tie. And then I made two separate tops to go over the skirt. 
using the tool and the netting and the you know the glitter stuff wow. to make two dresses with you know four layers of of tool and satin for the skirt we couldn't do that there was just you have to watch the money part of it oh i couldn't imagine that but it it's fun it i i enjoy what i do here um we did the tin man out of stuff from lowe's hardware store you know how did you find that fabric that you used for his helmet and the bodice oh how well, did you stumble onto that or did you know what you wanted well the monday before the play was to open on friday <laughs> rehearsal and the the outfit that we made for the tin man was out of insulation materials the um silver wrap for hot water heaters <laughs> and it made too much noise on the stage that's right that's right so so we had to go to walmart at midnight and it was a shiny stretch material that we bought and we made it like a um t-shirt type top so that um it came a tunic that came down over the legs and we had hooked the arms the metal arms well they weren't really metal but the you know insulation arms to this tunic so that it came down below the top of the legs it was um luck because and i had it done by the next day which is no fun time but you know, to be told that the Tin Man made too much noise on stage four days before opening night was, you know, you have to have a sense of humor. It'll be okay. It'll be all right. I don't know how you did it. I really don't. You had some sleepless nights. Yes. Yes. Well, you helped me with that. For the emblem for the um, flying monkeys. The one time that a quilting like quilting you know background came in handy to help up help out with costumes is that i fused and i just all i did was make little patches for their the costumes that debbie made that's all i did i didn't do much at all well we but, did little vests they were little kids you know and so we made vests and nancy put the emblem on the back which said you know what was it? Wicked Witch of the West? Yeah. WW. WW. Yeah. And, and, and then from the vest, I had um, tool wings for them to fly. And I also hooked the tail to the vest because they were kids. If you hook a tail to their pants, they'll pull on it, tug on it, and then the pants will rip. And so... The tail had to go on the vest, and then the wings were attached at the shoulder to the vest. And then I used uh, tie or elastic to hook it to the elbow and the wrist so they could literally fly across stage. But we had glitter in our house. I believe we still have glitter in our house and the floor and everywhere else. <laughs> That was oh. two years ago. <laughs> that was, wasn't it? Wow. Yeah. yeah. That was that was good. But the day before the day before performance, I found out that there was an extra monkey. No. And then That's right. I thought the kid was a um, was there in case one of the other ones got sick. And so I hadn't I didn't have his name down as a needing a costume. Oh. So I made a costume that night and we faked one of Nancy's things. <laughs> <laughs> it was not quite the same caliber as as the back, but it was, you know. There's there's goofs. Yes, there's there's many 
oops, you know, be one with the, the seam ripper. But we do a lot of, <laughs> I, I do a lot of alterations for things, you know, that don't quite fit or were used in 15 other performances and have, have you know, the hems, hems definitely are out of them. Any of the long period outfits, there's no hems in them anymore. Or the waists don't fit anymore or the sleeves aren't quite right. So, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> it's fun. But mine are single, you know, shorter term outfits. They're not as time consuming as Nancy's projects. <laughs> Two totally separate two different kinds of, of selling. Quilt. I yeah. do not quilt. <laughs> two different times of types of yeah, using a sewing machine. Completely different. And and it was you know what was really interesting was in Debbie's class, that was a fun class. <laughs> Thank um, you. It was, it was. And working in the shop and then being able to say, oh, I could use that or I could use that. And oh my goodness, he has silk thread. Um, all of that was, was really nice. But getting used to a big uh, seam allowance, just, uh, yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't handle that. I couldn't deal with it. You need, need to, to give. Okay. You need to give. When you're fitting something, you need to give. I know. Quarter I'm inch to not the do it. Quarter inch seam. And you know, yeah. Yeah, the, the quarter inch seam. And if it, yeah, if you're, I guess if you're wearing it and you, it's a little tight, yeah, it's going to split. But if you've got that big seam allowance, it's not going to do that. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just couldn't get used to that. I don't know. Something something just really wasn't clicking there, but... Oh, well. Oh, well. Ralph is back. Uh, yes. Well, yeah, I was uh, busy. I've been busier today than I would be normally. It's kind of weird. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for this. This is great. Now, Nancy, oh, thank you so much. You did such a good job. And I'll edit this so I don't... My talking's not on here. And uh, there, there's no applause buttons or throw money buttons, um, but uh, we thank you. We thank you so much. And thank you, Nancy. You will be invited to join us again.